Now I would like to introduce our, speak, our first speaker, Chris Gostad, who is uh, going to talk to us about submucosal endoscopy, as I mentioned. Uh, it's uh, the second annual Peter Stevens lecture. Uh, Peter Stevens was my mentor at Columbia and was my partner in, the, in our two-man ERCP team there that was handling all the ERCPs at Columbia for about seven or eight years. So we went through a lot of tough times together. He was uh, really a, a, my endoscopic father. And uh, basically, every, every time I do something in the endoscopy unit, his memory comes up because of some way of dealing with a catheter, some day of dealing with frustration, and uh, other <laughs> Uh, things that just come up in a busy endoscopic day. It's, uh, it's, it's really uh, my honor to uh, honor him as a masterful endoscopic teacher by uh, having Chris Gostow tell us how he came up with the idea of some causal endoscopy. Thank you. Well, while I'm <clears throat> booting up my talk here, I can, um, even though I'm coming from Minnesota, um, we, do, we are international. We have international falls. If you listen to the weather, they're always quoting uh, international falls as the coldest spot in, uh, in the United States. Actually, in Minnesota, it's really um, Tower, Minnesota, which is near international falls. And yesterday morning, um, I, uh, it was minus two degrees when I put on my cross-country skis. I go cross-country skiing before I go to work in the morning. I'm out there with a headlamp at 5 o'clock in the morning, and it was minus 2.8 yesterday morning. So there you go. There's some contrast. Um, I'm very happy to be back here to Long Island Live. I thoroughly enjoyed the experience last time. It was a good group uh, to be with, work with, and spend the day with. And I'm truly honored to be uh, uh, chosen to give the Peter Stevens Memorial Lecture this morning. I actually tried to recruit Pete to come to Mayo at one time a number of years back, and, uh, but his heart was in New York, and uh, so be it. Um, submucosal endoscopy, that's the theme for this morning, and I'm going to be presenting the road, how we got there, um, the thinking behind it, the experiences that uh, brought the idea of converting the submucosa into a working space. I do have some disclosures, as you see here before you. And so let's begin the road. Uh, the road began in actually in 98. Uh, with reconstructing ESD. ESD was just starting to surface at this point, and uh, there appeared some flagrant issues with ESD at that time. Training, skill maintenance, especially in the United States, the target population, who would it be in this country? And then finally, the ultimate uh, uh, problem was reimbursement. So, we were, so I thought, listen, uh, we've got to somehow fix this problem. Maybe we can reconvert this procedure and turn it into something that might be more adaptable, more reimbursable, et cetera. So I set one of our fellows to work uh, thinking that, well, the first step will be to free up our hands. And my fellow spent a year and a half uh, kind of in that position that you see there. We mounted the endoscope. And I had her working with both hands simultaneously to see if we could perform ESD in a little more efficient, faster fashion with a little more control using two hands. Uh, that is, one hand on one instrument, another hand on the other instrument. Well, that didn't work very well because of parallel activity of instruments through double channel scopes. So then we moved on and uh, we thought about, well, we still need to take wide uh, resections of mucosa. It's advantageous to do on block resection. And uh, presented this to the Apollo group when we first met in 1998. And we targeted Barrett's esophagus. And we thought, okay, this is, this is maybe a way in the US we can deal with ESD. And so Olympus was very nice and built us these specialized caps that allowed us to cut the mucosa of the esophagus in a longitudinal fashion and in a circular fashion. And by so doing, we could remove large areas of esophageal mucosa. Um, basically, we could strip the entire esophagus if we wanted to using this method. The problem with the method was that we couldn't get circumferential complete excision without inducing stenosis. But we learned a lot from what we did stripping the esophageal mucosa uh, for these Barrett's patients. We learned a lot about the submucosa and submucosal fluids. And what we really learned was the principle or the, uh, the phenomenon of delamination. Uh, 
the, uh, the observation that carried this forth was the fact that we learned that the mucosa, including the lamina propria and the muscularis mucosa, very easily separates from the submucosa. And that's why we were able to do this WEMR technique, even though it wasn't a winner technique. Uh, we thought, okay, so the submucosa has got a unique property. And this delamination uh, occurs most commonly and easiest in the esophagus and actually in the colon, uh, but it's technically very easy, if, if not easier to do, uh, in the stomach. So when you look at the histology of the bowel wall, here's the submucosa, and it's, it presents itself as a natural space uh, where you could maybe take advantage of this space and turn it into something useful. And so delamination was the next thought process uh, moving away from widespread endoscopic mucosal resection, uh, I started thinking we're going to have to start playing with the mucosa and the submucosal layer itself. So the, in uh, 2004, uh, in our developmental endoscopy unit, we started the PSYOP project. I thought it had a cool ring to it. It sounded almost like a spy-like thing. This was the submucosal inside-out project. And the concept was to convert the submucosa into an effective working space um, so that we can put an endoscope or endoscopic devices could be placed into the space. Why would we want to do this? Well, if you're working from the inside and you're directing your attention to mucosal disease, let's say Barrett's esophagus or a flat spreading uh, um, colon polyp, from working from the inside of the gut wall towards the lumen is incredibly safer than trying to work in the opposite direction, which we do every day. We take out mucosal disease, we're, more, we're working towards the outside of the gut wall. So working from the inside towards the lumen seemed to make sense if we could create an effective space. And then we could work outside. We'd have a safe space from which we could exit the gut wall and um, use the overlying mucosa that's covering the submucosal space that's been transformed as a protective band-aid, allowing safe access to either the deep gut layers of the wall, muscularis propria in the case of the poem procedure, and body cavities in the case of notes. So that was the birth of PSYOP. Now I'm gonna take you through this. Um, so here's another schematic of the gut wall. And once again, the submucosal layer is very distinctive. It's kind of a welcome mat for some kind of intervention. We learned a lot from fluid cushions. We know, again, we can del delaminate the mucosa very easily by puffing up the submucosa with a submucosal fluid cushion. But working in fluid layers uh, sometimes can be inconvenient. So we moved on to the next step, and we thought, okay, let's get rid of the fluid, and let's make a space. So we, did, uh, we worked on high, uh, high blasts or high pressure blasts of CO2 and converted the submucosa into an air space. This was a, when we used, uh, we went down to Office Max and bought these um, uh, computer screen dusters, and that's what we used to do gas dissection of the submucosa. The problem with that was it left a lot of air cells, and it wasn't as open a space as we wanted, although it was pretty, uh, it was pretty impressive to see. So then we thought, okay, we can, we can at least uh, manipulate the submucosa. Then we moved on to balloon dissection. Blunt dissection is a very common surgical technique. It's a technique that's used, including with balloons, uh, in the retroperitoneum. Anywhere there's connective tissue planes, uh, uh, blunt dissection can be very effective. And what is the submucosal space? It's basically a, it's a connective tissue plane. And so we moved ahead with balloon dissection of the submucosa, and that really hit it off in being able to create a true effective working space in the submucosa. The beauty of the technique was it was an offset entry. So by going in at one end and doing your work at the other end gave you the safety of the overlying mucosal band-aid, and it made it very easy to close afterwards, which you wouldn't have to close full thickness. You just had to close a mucosal entry point. And so we have the effective submucosal endoscopy, a submucosal working space. One can go outside to the deep layers of the gut wall, or one can turn around and head back towards the gut lumen and work on mucosal disease in a safer direction. So we call it SEMF, submucosal endoscopy with mucosal flap. And we thought SEMF was equivalent to safe access for interventional endoscopy. Easy to perform, you can use off-the-shelf tools and methods 
Uh, it evolved into the POEM procedure uh, using ESD methods. Uh, it minimizes contamination with offset entry, as I had pointed out with that cartoon, and it's really easy to close the entry point. Now I'm going to make some points here about uh, transesophageal access. Actually, when we first uh, developed the technique for use in the esophagus, we were really targeting the heart, uh, and our goal was actually to do a left atrial appendage resection. And, um, and as you watch this video, you're going to see plenty of it today. Um, it's, uh, uh, the technique initially involves the use of a submucosal fluid cushion with whatever uh, fluid you choose. Uh, entering the mucosa, as you see here, just uh, a needle knife is used to puncture the mucosa and allow, uh, as you, uh, later on, a dilating balloon to be placed. So here we've, we've uh, enlarged the mucosal entry point and how we put in a uh, balloon catheter. So this is the principle of blunt dissection. It's safe, it's atraumatic, and allows you to rapidly uh, uh, move down the length of the esophagus to the esophagogastric junction. Once you've got the space created, the scope can go in. Now we're fulfilling the uh, concept of creating a, an effective working space within the submucosa. And, and again, later today, you'll see a variety of techniques to create this submucosal space. But what we're moving towards now is um, actually a resection of the uh, esophageal wall muscle layer. Uh, and you'll watch it's being done with this EMR cap. Uh, the technique that we in initially developed was to use this method uh, as a safer entry point into the mediastinum. By sucking in the, the muscle wall, we could avoid uh, inadvertently uh, injuring some major organs, since the axis that we use in this method is posterior. Uh, if you put the patient on the left side, the scope kind of naturally falls in a posterior five, six o'clock position. And so you see a, a pretty standard EMR type myotomy. And this is what got us thinking about achalasia. This would be a, a great technique to use in patients with achalasia. And when the Apollo group remet um, shortly after the PSYOP uh, uh, process started, Jay Pazricha, who had a keen interest in achalasia, said, hey, let me, let me try it. Let me do an animal experiment and see if this really can work for achalasia. And so it began. And so if you t do this, you create this hole, uh, a complete but very focal myotomy, and you allow it to heal, you get this mucosal band-aid. This is exactly, here's your myotomy site, and here's the mucosal layer, the beauty of the technique, safe access. So what about uh, transesophageal axis? What are the, what's the low-hanging fruit? Achalasia myotomy, which you're gonna have plenty of today. Lymph node sampling, sampling and lymphadenectomy. Uh, this could be a great option uh, to work within the mediastinum. We're currently using submucosal endoscopy to try to place the Lynx device, this anti-reflux tool that's actually a very effective anti-reflux uh, measure for some patients. Uh, but our ultimate goal is to still go after the left atrial appendage. It's uh, very accessible uh, using a SEMF access to the mediastinum. Let's go back to achalasia. In our mind, in our lab, we still think there are some significant challenges. So here we have the esophagogastric junction. Yes, uh, it's really cool to do a fine dissection of the circular muscle layer. It physiologically and technically uh, uh, seems to satisfy the equation for achalasia. But what about complete myotomy? Complete myotomy is way uh, more efficient and faster to, to do. And uh, if we really want to duplicate a Heller myotomy, why not do a complete myotomy in instead of spending all the time doing a meticulous dissection of the circular muscle? So we think this is still uh, an issue that needs to be addressed and challenged. We did an animal experiment uh, funded by NOSCAR, which actually showed no difference between the two techniques. So we might be able to save time, uh, have a more efficient method, not necessarily this one that you're seeing here, but this moves us on to our next thought uh, as you're watching this uh, same type of EMR myotomy. So that gives us the safe access to the mediastinum, and then we put in an IT knife and literally slide up along the muscle wall to create the full thickness myotomy. Yes, you have to make some special preparations because now you're getting a pneumomediastinum and pneumoperitoneum, but th those can be dealt with pretty easily. So our thought then is if, if it's complete myotomy, why not a strip resection? Then you can really guarantee duplicating surgical results. Why not cut a strip of the muscle off? It's just as easy to do. Um, 
And then we all have a lot of, always have discussions as to what should be the length of the submucosal tunnel to really be safe on the exit point. Um, if you think about hellermyotomy surgically, the surgeons have the best access to the stomach, and that's the most difficult access to the endoscopist. Uh, dissecting down into the gastric cardia a sufficient length or distance to enable an effective clinical myotomy. So the surgeons get this access the best. They have poor access to the esophagus, but they have to dissect the hiatus, and that's what gives the patient reflux afterwards and forces them to do an anti-reflux procedure. So why not do a, um, uh, a hybrid procedure? You don't have to worry about targeting the cardia endpoint. The endoscopist can handle the esophagus down to just into the cardia, and the uh, laparoscopist can handle the gastric side uh, way more effectively, perhaps, than the endoscopist. So we may even see a hybrid procedure. That would certainly solve a lot of issues with regard to reimbursement. And then there's the issue of the myotomy location. Where should it be? As I mentioned earlier, if you put a patient naturally on the left side for an endoscopy, the endoscope flows naturally posteriorly. Um, others use an anterior approach. It probably doesn't really matter in the long run, but if it's going to evolve into a hybrid procedure, uh, it's going to be an anterior approach. A couple of comments on transgastric, transcolonic access. What are the low-hanging fruit there in submucosal endoscopy? Staging peritonoscopy. There's no reason why the gastroenterologist cannot do a, an effective staging peritonoscopy using submucosal endoscopy for access. It very nicely directs the scope path, whether it's transgastric or transcolonic. And uh, you'll hear and see about uh, excising small subepithelial tumors, and especially tumors arising from the muscle layer. It's a nice way to, to uh, remove these lesions very conveniently for patients. I think I will uh, just yep, move through this pretty quickly. Whoops. So in transgastric axis, the same principles. Um, uh, that mirror the esophagus. This is what I really wanted to comment on this morning. As I mentioned earlier, the submucosal endoscopy can take you outside the gut lumen, but can it also draw you back into the gut lumen. So what you see here are a series of medical illustrations. The top three basically duplicate the ESD technique. And it differs now using submucosal endoscopy because instead of relying completely on needle dissection of an area of mucosal disease, we use blunt balloon dissection, much faster uh, and probably much safer. We've, in our lab, compared it head-to-head -head with ESD, and we indeed have found it to be way more efficient um, uh, of a technique for removing large uh, areas of mucosa. This is just a quick uh, video clip that will show you the very basics of using submucosal endoscopy uh, as a hybrid uh, ESD approach. So a needle knife is still used to create a tunnel in the submucosal layer. Uh, this is in a pig rectum that we're seeing right now. And once a little tunnel is created, we put in a simple ERCP stone balloon and start balloon dissecting the submucosa. It doesn't cr completely open it up. It leaves a few strands here and there, but easy enough for anybody to cut loose and uh, remove a wide uh, area of mucosal disease. So it's blunt balloon dissection. So in conclusion, the submucosa can be transformed into a working space. You're going to see it today uh, clinically. The initial clinical application of the concept of submucosal endoscopy via the POEM procedure confirms this concept. And uh, I do think that the ideal target clinical applications are yet to be identified. And uh, hopefully more Long Island Live cases will actually shed light on this and start to identify the best clinical cases for submucosal endoscopy. I thank you very much. And come visit International Falls whenever you have the urge to feel a little chilly.